Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Well, good morning. (laughs) Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries, those of you who are here, those of you who will watch online, and those of you around the country, and even I think the farthest away is the island of Mauritius off Africa, where we've had people on become part of our online school. So that's pretty exciting, over 70 nations. So um, that's very exciting to me because, you know, when as soon as I saw Dennis minister to that woman who was having a meltdown up in New England and, and quick results, I said, this is huge. This could change the whole church. And that's been my passion, first of all, in our traveling years, to prepare materials and teach it. And we found that even young children, even young children can learn to apply the basics, learn to touch the presence of God in their spirit and live in the fruit of the spirit as a lifestyle. And as Bob Jones always said, the enemy can't touch the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, those are God's emotions. That's the love of God manifested in nine different ways. And it was meant not to just know intellectually, but to live and to experience. So right now, um, years ago, we did a peace challenge. And here is a journal to go through the peace challenge. that we, Dennis did a Sid Roth show on this, The Power of Peace. And after that show, we wrote the book to explain what peace really is, the supernatural power of peace, that peace is militant. The God of peace will crush the enemy beneath your feet. The God of peace, the first time mentioned in the Bible, was when it was the God of peace, the God of shalom that appeared to Gideon. And because of the shalom and because of the unity of that small army of 300, they routed a huge army and won a great victory that peace is militant. And most people don't under, most Christians don't understand the total power of peace and we know that Jesus himself is our peace and when you're in peace nothing can get past him so right now we're doing the peace challenge started July 1st we're going to do it for two months and the saints are becoming equipped in Ephesians 4 it talks about the saints equipped to do the work of the ministry. At, but you know you have to be equipped to minister in your own life before you're equipped to bring healing or victory to any anyone else. And there is a power of peace card with the small chart that is in this journal where you check yourself every day on how well you did in keeping your peace, staying in peace. And even, even we've had people before who would been be in a um, hostile home situation with demonic relatives, and they would drop down to their spirit and would blast peace into the atmosphere, and they saw people change because they were atmosphere changers. This is this is the God we serve. This is the peace that He gives us, and we do have. Uh, Actually, a teacher over at uh, CSCL, over at Morningstar, I don't know, she's still teaching over there, but she would teach the fruit of the Spirit to her class, and they learned to walk in it as a lifestyle. And this should be available to all believers. So this morning, 
um, this message came out of a word that uh, God quickened to me, or a phrase, and God quickened to Dennis at the same time. So there's probably going to be a series, multiple messages from both of us on this word he gave. Now, those of you who were here years ago when I taught on um, Leviticus and the offerings and not just what they point to in Jesus, but how we're supposed to live it out. The Bible is an experiential book, guys, and it's taught mostly as a book of information about things that happened or about types and shadows, but it's meant to be a lesson book for us to walk in the truth of it. So the title of this message this morning is Becoming Jesusly Human. Jesusly Human. Looking like Jesus, acting like Jesus, walking like Jesus, and experiencing Him in our everyday life. So the word that the Lord gave us is one that some of you will be familiar with, are the words meal offering, the meal offering from Leviticus. And do you know most believers prefer to skip Leviticus? Because for them it doesn't have any life in it. And yet it's full of life. And I'm going to begin explaining some of that this morning. Um, but it will need to be expanded because there's so much about it. And it's so important. Okay. So the points I'm going to be covering, the subjects I'm going to be covering, is first of all, how Jesus is divinely human. How Jesus is divinely human. Next, understanding the spirit of Jesus. Next, as in the title, Becoming Jesusly Human. Not what would Jesus do, but how would Jesus live as an experience. Becoming Jesusly Human. And finally, bringing Old Testament shadows to life. Do you know what the apostles taught those first 12, 8 to 12 years when the church was only meeting in Jerusalem before the Gentiles started coming into the church. First of all, they went to Solomon's porch. They met there every Sunday morning. They probably celebrated Holy Communion Saturday night after the Sabbath ended, and then they would show up at dawn because most of them had to work on Sunday. They would show up at dawn and meet together in Solomon's porch or Solomon's portico in the temple. By the way, the early church didn't just meet in houses. Their formal service was in Sol on Solomon's porch. And what they taught, it said they taught the scripture. They opened, they, the churches always had a Bible. The Bible that they had before the New Testament um, started being written, which was very soon after the day of Pentecost, they remember how Jesus opened up the scriptures to them on the road of Emmaus? There's so much richness in the Old Testament yeah. that we who have the relatively abbreviated New Testament need to understand the Old Testament to get the fullness of the details of all that is involved in Christianity. Okay, so how Jesus is divinely human. What is a human? Now, it's common to hear people excuse their bad behavior by saying, I'm only human. That's why I blow it. That's why I have such bad behavior. That's what, why I do so many bad things. Actually, what we mean when we're saying that is that I'm acting in a subhuman way. God created human beings in his image to be expressions of God. And that is 
what the Bible teaches us. It teaches us how to have life, the life that God gives in us, how to live by that life. I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. We live by another life. And through that life, the transformation that God produces in us, then, as Ephesians says, then, not our, not our flesh, not our natural life, not our carnal emotions, but then the life, the divine nature that he's produced in us, that he's transformed us to walk in, then that can be connected by bonds of peace, it says in the book of Ephesians, so that we can really become a church that's been built by Jesus, connected by the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus can't build anything with our flesh. You know, the churches are not supposed to be hospitals um, nursing wounded people with their with their roots and their um, carnal emotions popping out all over the place. Jesus can build with the life he's produced in us. That's what that's how Jesus builds. And truly from beginning to end the main subjects in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament are life, the production of life and then building. So, what is a human? Well, actually a human, true human is somebody who lives in a much different way than what we generally see in society. And the truth is only one man has ever lived up to God's standard of humanity. The perfect man, Jesus. And Jesus is not only fully divine, he is fully human. Jesus lived as a human on earth for 30 years before he ever moved in the power of the Spirit and did signs, wonders, and miracles. But in Jesus' perfect humanity, we see how we should live. Do you think Jesus ever failed to do his chores? Do you think Jesus ever made a mess and then didn't clean it up? Do you think Jesus talked back to his mother? No, he lived as a perfect human being. He lived a perfect life. Jesus lived by the emotions of God, the God emotions, the fruit of the Spirit. Every moment of his earth walk, he never moved out of the will of God, and he never moved out of life in the spirit, supernatural, divine life. Now, in redemption, he died for us, of course, but that's not all Jesus did for us. It's, that's the God, That's the low gospel of salvation, barely forgiven, going to heaven someday. But it says in Romans 3.23, all have died and fall short of the glory of God. We're told in Hebrews 2.10 that Jesus is the captain or pioneer of our salvation, bringing his sons and daughters into the realm of glory in the throne room of God itself, that Jesus came so that he could be the ladder connecting us to the kingdom of the heavens, the, the seat of authority, seat of heavenly authority, the throne room of God, so that when we pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and live according to that. We're actually advancing the kingdom of God on earth. And that prayer, the, the Lord's prayer is a militant prayer. It's calling for us to pray that God's kingdom will be released through us individually and corporately on earth so that we can see God's power and glory here. These are the disciples that we're supposed to be made into. This is what our pastors are supposed to do to equip us to be that kind of human.
Now I want to define grace for you. Grace has been defined as unmerited favor. As a matter of fact, there was a survey done. Um, I'm not sure if it was Barna or, or who did the survey. No, that was John Bevere who did the survey or found the survey that 98 of believers, the only definition they understood for grace was unmerited favor. And it's true that grace starts there. But grace as unmerited favor is like calling Mount Everest a speed bump. It's so much more than that. Grace is Jesus, the perfect man, living in us, as us, and through us to impact the world, not go sit in our churches and be nice people. We're to go be salt and light, light and actively affect society around us. We are supposed to, by Jesus' spirit, flow out of this place just like the river flew, flowed out of Ezekiel's temple, bringing life everywhere that it goes, the divine kind of life. Grace is a person. Grace is the power to resist sin. Grace is the power to live like Jesus lived. Because it's no longer I who live, but Jesus lives in me. So how do we let him live in, in us? We yield to him. We surrender to him. And there are three major levels of surrender that the Bible teaches unto in Romans 12.1, it says, and boy, is this scripture misused. I beseech you, brothers, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice? Why? Now, Paul has explained this all in the lead up to that verse. He is explaining to believers how to live on the highest plane the throne room plane, seated together with Jesus in heavenly places. And that seated together with him means the place of authority, the place of rule, the place where authority can be released out on the earth. No longer I who live, but Jesus lives in me. Now in the four Gospels we can read how Jesus lived on earth, perfectly surrendered. Father God spoke through Jesus. Father God did miracles through Jesus. Jesus never deviated from the will of God. Well, Paul is telling us in that verse, surrender yourself so that God can have that much of you. so that he can move on earth through you. We know that the book Reese Howells, Intercessor by Norman Grubb, explains how this actually happened in the life of one particular man. And it is a beautiful book, if you can get a copy of it. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's still in print out there. It explains how the Holy Spirit came to Reese and said, if I come in, I come in as God. And you get out of the way. So Paul is asking for that drastic sacrifice. The whole book of Hebrews is talking about moving from the outer court to the holy place into the holy of holies. Let God have that much of your lives. What are you holding yourself back for? For earthly pleasures? For, for whatever reason? Because it makes you nervous at the thought of being fully surrendered by fully surrendered to God. That's the whole purpose of the book of Hebrews, a call to let Jesus have all of you so Jesus can live through you. Okay. Now, in the four Gospels, we see how Jesus lived on earth. There's Matthew, Mark, John, and particularly Luke demonstrates Jesus living as the perfect man. Jesus was the perfect expression of the Father, and we are likewise called to be expressions of Jesus on earth. 
To be an expression is not just words, but it's a life lived out before the world. To be expressions of him, our own lives must be a declaration that Jesus is not only Lord of the universe, he is Lord in us. See, I believe most believers have um, come to know Jesus as Savior, but they've never come to the place of total surrender that he can be Lord in their lives. But we are called to live by the humanity of Jesus in our daily walk. And the easiest way to know you're doing it right is learn to stay connected to the peace of Jesus. Because he'll tell you when you're not connected. When Dennis was learning this as a young believer, the Lord spoke to him and he said, don't let, he was upset about something that had happened at work. Who knows that upset is not a fruit of the Spirit? And the Lord spoke to him and he said, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. When we lose our peace, it's as though we were the branch and the vine that disconnected itself. We have disconnected from our life source. And I believe this is easy. Now you can teach how to practice all the fruits of the Spirit. You can, you can teach believers that when, you're, when you feel prompted to help someone or give something to someone or, or do a good deed of some kind, if you stay connected to Jesus in your spirit and while you're doing it, let the love of God flow from your heart out to that person, it becomes not dead works, but living. We're not called to dead works. We're called to live out of the fruit of the spirit and bring life to everything we do. Otherwise, it's just wood, hay, and stubble rather than gold and precious stones. If we don't live by the divine humanity of Jesus, <coughs> our daily life is subhuman. So we have a group of people here and those that we are connected to around the world who are taking this seriously, who don't want religion. They want the reality of life that Jesus gives. We want the living God. We want the living God, not dead religion. In Revelation 19, 6 through 8, it says, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. His wife has made herself ready. What we're doing is preparing. And not everybody attends the marriage supper of the Lamb. That that's reserved as a reward for those who have made themselves, re made themselves ready. We've told of the wise and foolish virgins, which is what we're doing in discipleship here, that all ten of the virgins, and they were made so they'd look exactly alike. You couldn't tell any difference just by looking at them. And it says that they had light or fire or in their spirits. The light was shining in their spirits. Every believer has a spirit with a flame, the flame of Jesus in it. They all had that. Every single one of them had that. So they were all believers. But then they had vessels that they had with them. And some had extra oil and some didn't. Well, what is the vessel? Well, the lamp inside that's burning speaks of the spirit. The vessel, the exterior vessel, speaks of the soul, the part of you that surrounds your spirit. This is where your carnal humanity comes from. Your self-nature, your flesh, comes from your soul. 
Well, as we let Jesus transform us through going through the 60-day challenge where we allow God to show us the parts of us that need to be cleaned up, and then we do it supernaturally through Jesus the forgiver in us, and when we need to forgive somebody, we release forgiveness, and it becomes a testimony because Jesus transforms that area, washes out anything negative, any negative emotion attached to it, so then the love of God can flow freely and purely. That particular part of us has been transformed by the divine nature of God. And as God transforms us bit by bit, as we deliberately do the 60-day challenge or deal with issues that come up through going to Jesus and letting him touch them, it's like another drop of oil is in our soul. Another drop of divine anointing is in our vessel. So day by day, moment by moment, we are increasing our supply of oil if we allow Jesus to deal with our soul. The peace challenge actually goes beyond the 60-day challenge in that we're practicing all day long and we get to see day by day, sure, our, our failures and our successes, but we get to see that our lives are improving because practice makes permanent. If you practice something and become good at it, your prowess grows. Every time you have somebody annoy you and you drop down to Jesus and you release that person and let Jesus fill that area, you're being transformed. Now, his wife has made herself ready. And I wanted to share this with you because um, I felt like it, it fit here. What we're doing is we're preparing the bride. We don't want anybody in here to have the door shut when it comes to be invited into the wedding feast as our reward someday. So we had a prophetic intercessor come over here, um, called Dennis, talked to him, and then uh, came here and spoke a word the Lord had given him. And this is just a part of that. <clears throat> And he said, I want to connect this with a prophetic experience I had about 15 years ago. And I saw an angel standing outside a door crying. And as soon as I saw him, I felt all of his emotions, the love, the joy, the longing. And I asked him, why are you crying? He almost couldn't get the words out and said, because the bride is making herself ready. And then I looked up and saw a window open in heaven and there was this wind and it had all these raindrops and the scent of dew on it. And it was making these silver wind chimes clink and sing. And it would bring multitudes of angels, the sound of the bride awakening. It's the sound of spring because in spring, everything that was dormant comes to life. Everything that has been dormant in you, speaking to you, all of you, is about to spring up into new life. Everything that was dormant is about to spring up. And the song of the bride is now awakening over this place. And you're going to sing it together, just like when the Lamb who is light, the center of the new Jerusalem, comes. Every crystal in that building is lit up. And each one has a different frequency, a different song. But together it's a harmony that's released. And it's the harmony of perfect love and the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And that is what's being released here. And we have had... People who've never been here before pull up in the parking lot and come in and say, I could feel the unity, the one accord, the joining of the Spirit all the way out in the parking lot. People, this is what it's all about, letting Jesus come and build his church. Not our ideas, not man's plan, but letting Jesus do it. And he first has to connect us together. 
and then he can start to build. Okay, the next point is understanding the spirit of Jesus. John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Two points about this. Out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And Jesus actually used the word belly, koilia, in the Greek. That was the Greek word he used. And actually that's the only time that that particular Greek word is used for heart. I wonder about the Bible translators who changed that word to heart or innermost being or heavenly days. In one French translation, they changed it to chest. Um, this is a particularly interesting to me because if I were a Bible translator, and I ran across an unusual word used by Jesus himself, I would start praying about it and asking him to teach me. And that's so unusual, Jesus. What do you mean by that? Why out, why out of your belly? I mean, did Jesus make a mistake? Was he just wrong? And I would really start seeking him and I would tremble in fear before I would change the actual word Jesus used to something else. To me, that's pretty audacious to do something like that. So that tells you the location. And let's do an exercise right now. Everybody close your eyes. Get out of your head and go down to your heart and yield to Jesus in you. Now start releasing the Spirit, the peace of God, the love of God into this room. Can you tell the atmosphere changed in here? That's because you went down to your belly. You were obeying Jesus, and you were allowing rivers of living water to flow out of your belly. Now, what about people who think, okay, you can get back them in your heads. <laughs> no, try, try to do dual awareness. Try to stay down while you're thinking. Okay? <laughs> okay. Um, I forgot what I was going to say I'm doing that. <laughs> but seriously, that's a good idea. Why don't you stay drop down to your spirit and open here and stay open in, in your mind too. Okay, that's a good thing to practice during the day and at church. Why on earth then did Jesus say, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. It seems that the passage, the Spirit in this passage, is related to the humanity of Jesus. Remember, when Jesus came to earth, he became the father of a new race. He became something brand new that God was initiating. You see, without the humanity of Jesus, there could never be such a spirit because Jesus in himself combined 
the divine nature and the hum human nature, divinity and human humanity. It was something entirely new that Jesus accomplished in his incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension. The spirit, who is the living water here, combines the divine and the human without the humanity of Jesus, without him forging ahead, without him being the pioneer in this grand new thing God was doing, there could never be such a spirit. Now, we know that in times past, it's spoken of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. But this was something new. The scripture is speaking here of resurrection life, a resurrected humanity, divine life, mixed together with the human element. Listen to this in Romans 8.2. Paul speaks of the spirit of life, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 1.19, he speaks about the spirit of Jesus. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 talks about the spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit was over man, mostly on a, in a heavenly realm, but suddenly God was planning something new. He did it first in Jesus, And then on the day of Pentecost, Jesus poured out this new divine human spirit element. Jesus made it possible so that we could live as a new race of men. With the spirit and divine humanity in us. So before Jesus was glorified, resurrected, the spirit of Jesus was not yet, it says. In Jesus, the divine essence was mingled with his humanity. Does this sound a little different to you? Who in here is familiar with Andrew Murray? He wrote the book Absolute Surrender. His, his books are Christian classics. I mean, they're the kind you get that are not in paperback or regular hardback. They're the ones, you know, that are red with the gold lettering, you know, and the gold on the edges, you know, because they're special Christian classics. So he was a, um, he was a revival, a revivalist brought um, great move of God to South Africa. He was a pastor, writer, one of the most beloved and well-known authors in all of Christendom. And if you want to read some good stuff. Oh, his book about the uh, his commentary on the book of Hebrews called The Holiest of All. Just amazing, amazing. So here's what Andrew Murray says in his book, The Spirit of Christ. We know how the Son, who had from eternity been with the Father, entered upon a new stage of existence when he became flesh. When he returned to heaven, he was still the same only begotten Son of God, yet not altogether the same. For he was now also, as the Son of Man, the first begotten from the dead, clothed with glorified humanity. And just so the Spirit of God is poured out on Pentecost was something new. When poured out at Pentecost, he came as the spirit of the glorified Jesus, the spirit of the incarnate, crucified, and exalted Messiah, the bearer and communicator to us, not of the life of God as such, but of that life as it had been interwoven into human nature in the person of Messiah Jesus. Nathaniel had already said in the book of John, that he recognized Jesus, that he was the Messiah. And Jesus said to them, you're going to see the heavens opened and you're going to see that Jesus stairway and the angels of God ascending and descending as they partner with man from the throne room of God. Jesus said he was doing something new. 
that men were going to become heavenly agents on earth because they were connected to the throne room in God down to earth so that Jesus can move through us. But it took a new element in the spirit. The only begotten, the firstborn, Hebrews 12, 10, Jesus the captain bringing many sons and daughters unto his glory. The book of Romans categorized it in three levels of our Christian walk. Justified, sanctified, and glorified. The outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. In 1 John 2, verses 12 through 14, John calls it little children, young men, and fathers. The three level of surrender that we can move into. We had a move of God in this church a few years ago where pretty much everybody here entered into the second level, the young men level, which is I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. See, most Christians, they live a life separate from Jesus. In the second level, he becomes our life, and we no longer have a sense of separation from God, but a, sep a, a sense of Jesus living his life through us. That's the second level. All the way through the Bible, the three rooms of the tabernacle. Now, Jesus will forever be the Son of God and the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the one who's seated on the throne. Listen to this. In Acts 7.55, Stephen saw Jesus as the Son of Man on the throne of heaven. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He didn't say the Son of God. He said the Son of Man. Jesus became human and he will remain human for all eternity. True human and deity combined, but still human. The Son of Man is the one walking in the midst of our local churches. The Apostle John saw the risen and ascended Lord Jesus walking among the churches as the Son of Man. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, Revelation 1, 10 through 15, in the midst of the seven lampstands was walking one like the Son of Man. So we've been given what we need. We have been given this same spirit that we can live according to the divine nature but still mixed with our humanity. Only partaking of the divine humanity of Jesus makes us suitable for God. So we become Jesusly human. We no, no longer say, how would, what would Jesus do? We say, how would Jesus live and then yield to him? You see, his, Jesus in his divine humanity is in us. We don't have to beg him to live through us that way. We yield to him and he becomes that aspect of his humanity that we need. Someone that we know was talking about a realization that we don't have to ask Jesus for patience. We yield to the one who is patience in us. We don't ask Jesus to love through us. We yield to his love and allow it to be a flow of life coming from us. We must live by the humanity of Jesus to live as he did, as he was an expression of God on earth, and he wants us to be expressions of God on earth. And by the way, Jesus grew in his humanity because he was born a baby, and he became a child and then a young man. As a child, he had chores and responsibilities. As a young man, he worked in the family business. He came to us as a man. As the son of man, his humanity was perfect and balanced. In the peace challenge, we're growing 
in that. We can practice that. And now let's begin a little bit on what is going to be a subject we'll go into in depth in days ahead. Bringing Old Testament shadows to life. In Genesis, we know, God created man, placed him in a beautiful garden, and had a relationship. The beginning of Genesis is absolutely wonderful. Can you imagine being there at creation, watching like the angels as God did all this? I mean, just absolutely astounding. I don't think you could make a movie that could show how wonderful and and powerful this was. God created the heavens, the earth, and man. But then man fell, and the rest of Genesis is not quite so lovely. Then the troubles began. Now, man was created as the center of God's creation and was made to know God, be an expression of God and represent God to the rest of the world, but failed dismally. There is so much failure in the book of Genesis. And then by the time you get to Genesis, the one that the book that started with this amazing creation of God ends up with Joseph's bones in a coffin. It ends up with death. Now, um, so that's a sad ending, I think. I do not like sad endings. I, I will, if I know a movie has a bad ending, I won't watch it. You know, really, seriously. Yeah, uh, remember that, that movie, Message in a Bottle? And this couple meets and they fall in love There's because of a message found in a bottle. And then the guy drowns at the ending. I thought, okay, we're gonna change this right now. Okay, it's see. I'm going to rewrite the ending. Okay, they're having a memorial service. There are all these beautiful flowers and people are crying. But all of a sudden, this guy, drenched, dripping water, comes walking in. Seaweed, draped with seaweed. And they have a wedding. Isn't that a better ending? Don't like sad endings. Okay. But then we get to Exodus. After the sad ending, Exodus starts off sad. He starts off with his God's people enslaved in Egypt. But there's a wonderful ending. In the beginning, we see a free... Well, after the beginning, we suddenly see a people brought through the Red Sea. They're free. They're set free from Egypt. Pharaoh's armies drowned in the sea. And then we see a free people worshiping God with a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud to guide and protect them. And it ends up, by the end of Exodus, we have the tabernacle of Moses, the tent of meeting, with the three rooms, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. But God never wanted to leave us in the outer court or even in the holy place. His purpose all along was to have sons and daughters brought to glory and be part of his family in the Holy of Holies. Do you realize in Genesis in the Garden of Eden, there was no separation between God and Adam and Eve? But at this point in the story, in Exodus with the tabernacle of Moses or the tent of meeting, God was unveiling part of his plan. And God moves and unveils bit by bit of his plan. And of course, we know that in the book of Revelation, it ultimately ends with the New Jerusalem with God, with all his children and his light shining through all of them in a wonderful, wonderful harmony. Okay. The tent of meeting. Okay, well, let's pray for second level for all of you now. So we call this the replaced life because we replace our old carnal life for Jesus' life. And once you've entered into something, you have an anointing that other people can cross that threshold and enter into it. So, right. So we're going to pray now. And all of you, even if you've done it, done it before and have entered into the experience, 
you can always have a refresher, okay? So, Lord, I am a selfer. I have been trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. And Lord, that does nothing but wear me out and leave me frustrated and frustrates other people. But you say in Galatians 2.20 that we can live in another way. And so right now, Jesus, I forsake that way of life. I see you've made a better way to live. And it's through me yielding to Jesus in me, me joined to Jesus, not me going it alone, but me connected with Jesus every moment of every day so that he becomes my life. I get out of the way and he lives through me. I no longer live. It's no longer I that live, but Jesus living through me. And I release that anointing for everyone here to be raised to another level, to stop living independent of you, to live joined together with you. One life, you and Jesus fused together, a replaced life, that brand new life that Jesus came to give us. Just yield to it. Just drink in a new way of living. Me joined with Jesus. I'm never alone. I'm never left to my own resources. He's always with me. All I have to do is go to my spirit and yield. And he's always there. I don't have to try. I don't have to struggle. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we take on a new yoke today. And in that yoke, we live by the grace of Jesus, his power in me. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so at the end of Exodus, we see the tent of meeting. And you can call it the tabernacle of Moses, but I just love the tent of meeting because, see, man could meet with God and God could meet with man, joined in one place what God had longed for ever since, ever since man was driven out of the Garden of Eden in Genesis. Suddenly, man and God back together again in a meeting place. God was no longer in the heavens far, far away. He was also on earth, accessible, speaking in a voice that we could hear, that man could hear. And moreover, God raised up a group of people built together, joined together in the tent of meeting and from the tent of meeting in Exodus 19, 6, and you now, you Israelites, if you, if you accept this mission, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God was going to use a group of people to express God to the pagan nations. Nations doing horrible things and evil things. And now God would have a light on earth. They didn't always cooperate very well, but this was God's plan. But guess what? God's never discontinued that plan. And Peter 2.9, 1 Peter 2.9, he speaks to us and says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you're not alone as you do this. You join together with Jesus, 
are to be this and to do this and demonstrate it to the world. Now, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. What? Would you like? Dear Actually, we could have closed with the prayer for, for oh, second uh, level. Well, I, but, I, I wanted but, to at least say minute. something about that. I want to pray for okay. How many prayed that prayer? Because I want to tell you what it, well, how it will show up. Prayed that prayer, entering into second level, to where all of a sudden you're going to be aware of a consciousness of a we instead of me. It's very subtle, but it means that something transpired on the inside for the better. You'll start thinking in terms of we, which, by the way, if you ever have feelings that you're alone, that's an impossibility with Jesus in you. It's impossible to be alone, that that is being perpetrated from outside. And it can also be flesh or demonic. Alone is an impossibility. But once you enter into saying it's no longer I who live, which suggests it's no longer I who forgive, which suggests it's no longer I who love, that means that independent I gets dissolved to we. A new creation is me and Jesus together. And all of a sudden, you're going to find yourself, if you've graduated with that prayer, oh, you just want to hug me. <laughs> if you graduated with that prayer, there will be a transition in, in terms of spontaneity of thinking in terms of we. We is a conscious awareness of the new creation reality of the joining of humanity with deity, a new creation, something that never existed before. But many people receive Jesus as their Savior and then try to live the Christian life for who knows how many years. Learn the Bible, get very articulate with quoting Scripture, but at the same time it's working for God rather than with Him and allowing Him to do the work through you. Okay, that's all. Okay, just a few more thoughts before we close, because I said I was going to say something about the meal offering. Um, now, the basic structure of the Ark of the Covenant, what held the tent itself up, was not just gold. There were boards covered with gold, um, but there were wooden boards, which represents humanity. And it's like the Ark of the Covenant was wood covered by gold. It was the wood that gave strength to the gold because a thin layer of gold would not be enough to support the weight of the tabernacle. So now we can look at it. Everything in the tabernacle represents Christ. But it also points to something for us. This is what Jesus was opening up to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. This is what they were teaching. They were teaching how to live the Old Testament, how to not just point, that's Christ, to this is for me as well. And then um, we know that if God is calling us to be a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation, that this is not only for us individually, it's for us corporately. And you know that um, as we see Jesus increased in us, then when we come together as a group, then we can offer, offer our transformation back to God as an act of worship. See, as a congregation, Jesus, look how much Christ has changed us this week. Look how much, look at the extra drops of oil in my vessel. And then we can offer that as a congregation, as worship to God. Now, Leviticus comes after Exodus and is actually a practical book showing us how to worship and enjoy God if we enter into it as a spiritual experience. Now, 
the offerings in Leviticus, it's the book of Leviticus goes on at length with the offerings. Jesus is the tent of meeting, but Jesus is also the offerings of the tabernacle. He's the way for God to come to man and the way for man to go to God. And there were five main offerings, the burnt offering, the meal offering or the wheat, ground wheat offering, the flour offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. Now the two main ones for us and for our living, although we can participate and practice all of them, um, represent... Well, we know Jesus is the Lamb of God, is represented by the burnt offering. Animal life is for redemption. That's something God does in the offerings. But the offerings that come from plant life, as in the meal offering, is reproducing life. Now, Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's also the grain of wheat that died. But then he also turns around and says that Follow me and take up your cross. You're to be grains of wheat that fall into the ground and die also. So the meal offering, as it points to Jesus, represents a life lived perfectly for God. So we know, first of all, that Jesus was our lamb, our, he was our burnt offering, and that's something God can do, but... Um, then the meal offering is something Jesus first offered to the Father. But it's not for us just for Jesus to do. It's for us to offer that to the Father too. Um, the meal offering was grain, grains of wheat, ground into fine flour. This represents the surrender of the will. It represents the, a life lived perfectly for God without coarseness, without lumps in the flour. You know, like when you take flour and you sift it to make sure there are no lumps in what you produce. The fine flour is the humanity of Jesus, a life that is perfectly soft toward God with no coarseness or hardness of rebellion. Now, in with the flour, there was also mixed oil, speaking of the spirit, frankincense sprinkled on it, representing resurrection life, and salt with purifying, preserving, and lasting power. And this was the meal offering. And yes, it's what Jesus, what Jesus presented to the Father in his life. But it's also an example of, for us, the flour needs to be ground fine. Our humanity needs to be submitted to God. We don't just go ahead and do what we want to do. It's like, it's like teaching children um, to not take the bigger slice of cake. Actually, if you, if you let one child cut it and the other child get to choose, it'll be pretty evenly sliced. But left to our own, we would take the bigger slice. But in our humanity, our life, we need to be ground fine in our will and submitted to God. How would Jesus live? We assimilate the humanity of Jesus to be presentable and pleasing to God. We assimilate the humanity of Jesus to reveal Jesus in the world. It's a new way of living. And then when we come together on Sundays, we have a meal offering to present. Well, we've got to do this individually first. But then on Sundays, we come together and we can present this to God as an act of worship. God, we let Jesus live through us in his divine humanity this week. We lived a life of surrender to you. We didn't rebel against you or, or go our own way. 
we are presenting to you the Christ that was formed in us this week, and that is acceptable worship to God. That is the meal offering. And the beautiful thing is that we have all received great help to do this because going through this week, it's no, no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. And he's not far away. All you have to do is yield and go to him. And he's there because we're joined to him in a replaced life. Well, I'm sure that we're going to be pursuing the subject of the meal offering since God spoke it to both of us on the same morning. The divine humanity of Jesus and us becoming Jesusly human. Amen. Okay. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.